Welcome back. Another episode of the Better Learning Podcast. I have Glenn Robbins with me today, and he is an active superintendent with Brigantine Public School District in New Jersey, but he has such a different perspective, which is why I wanted to bring him in. So Glenn, first off, welcome. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to be on here today with you. We're recording in the summer here. You got another month before students uh, start up again. Uh, what's your mindset? How are you feeling? Mindset is uh, we get more done in the summer time than we get done <laughs> in the regular year. Uh, we have a bunch of different projects going on in our district, uh, multi-million dollar projects. So it has been nonstop this summer. But keeping, but you know what? I work three blocks from the beach. I was at a surf competition this morning. How much better? Uh, nice. That <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, well, I, I've been looking at the things that you do. And first off, how long have you been superintendent? In this district, just uh, almost four years now in this district. You're beating um, the average. Uh, that That's, yeah, that's a good start. Other, yes. I was superintendent before in another district for four years. So going on year number eight total, but I started here in February 2020 and then the world shut down in March 2020. So uh, <laughs> yeah so now like 18 years and COVID uh, years but... <laughs> <laughs> do you feel like you're past that and now you can actually like focus on the initiatives that you want to be pushing actually we did a lot of initiatives during the COVID time so I was really excited about that we utilized that opportunity that when it was chaos and we found the opportunities out of that and made so many great things happen so I'm really excited about what we've done in the last couple of years and where we're continuing to go yeah, what well, let's hear about what were some of the things that you that you pushed through that you think you normally wouldn't be able to do that if it wasn't for COVID? You know, that's a great question. You know, when the when the lockdown, I got to know people as a human being. Like I mentioned it. I'm like, when I was on lockdown, I had at that time my daughter was only three months old. Uh I had a brand new puppy and my son, you know, was uh uh, roughly in third grade at that time. So I was like, hey, I'm juggling too. I'm dealing what you're dealing with at home. I understand it, you know, during the lockdown. Uh, but then we were able to have some great conversations with people of my staff that I normally would not have gotten probably in a classroom. I uh, was able to bring in so many great speakers to speak with them over that time. Uh, once a month, to re refuel their mind, souls, and hearts to go back at it. And then we just kept at it. We kept doing like, you know, what can we do technology-wise updates while we're waiting? Before the supply chain really kicked off, we were able to get, you know, brand new infrastructure, Wi-Fi, uh, all brand new one-to-one -one devices, started way ahead of the schedule to get a uh, eSports arena here for the kids as well. So yeah, we really uh, embrace that opportunity of chaos and saw a lot of great things that could come out of that. And I know that's kind of weird to say, but, you know, we had some tough moments, don't get me wrong, with some some heartaches here and there along the way with some people that we lost and so forth. But, um, you know, to see a, a small town be very resilient, uh, no egos, and everybody wants to work together, the school board, the city council, the mayor, and especially our staff. Our staff is outstanding, what they do day in and day out. And uh, the ultimate compliment I can pay to them is that my own son comes to school here now. Yeah, um, very cool. I don't think it's any better than that. Yeah. So you're, how would you describe your perspective as a leader? Perspective as a leader as far as? Yeah, as far as you show how you show up for the people you serve, whether it's staff, community members. Um, it, it feels different from just reading and seeing what you're doing. So I'd love to hear it in your words. Yeah. So ultimately, you know, being a leader is about you know, creating an environment for better as everybody else, you know, it's focusing on their strengths, not necessarily their weaknesses, celebrating each and every little win. Everybody is a human being here. We base it off of uh, compassion and empathy, you know, and how do we work together to make it for the ultimate goal, which is our kids. How do we make them have the best possible school experience that they'll ever have? You know, so a cheerleader, very Ted Lasso-like. Um, I will say that. I've gotten plenty of things gift-wise because they don't think I'm that way. But I wear wacky suits on the holidays to make people smile. I wear a wacky suit, Pac-Man suit on the first day of school to help anxieties and depression or whatever it may be, you know, the jitters to come down a little bit. Uh, I dress up in Grinch outfits and leprechaun outfits all around town and so forth. Just like I said, I love making people smile. I love giving them an environment that they want to be here, that, that it's not just a job, it's a career, it's a passion. Like I said, that's why we're here. That's what we're here for. And I think we lose sight of that sometimes in education that we're so standardized or, or based on tradition. And 
my thought process is what if, how might we, and yes, and like, let's really embrace something and do something different that they will always remember because you're never going to know what a kid's going to remember. You know, you never know, know what that 30 second impact that day you have with that kid may persuade him or her for the rest of their lives. So I try to bring it each and every day, try to support everyone that I can. I realize that it's not all roses. It's not all Pollyanna happiness, but, you know, and we're emotion too. We, we, you know, we celebrate, we have hardships along the way, but this ultimately, like I said, trying to make this the best possible experience for not just the kid, not just the staff, but for anybody that walks through our doors. You're definitely talking my language. So we had our whole team. We did, we did, we used every quarter we would do like a book or some type of like series. So we did Ted Lasso as a team where we, we watched all three seasons and did that. And then one of the ones we did last year was fans first with, I don't know, Savannah bananas with, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Mm -hmm. if you track what the Coles are doing there, it's, it's pretty cool to, to see that. So it here, yeah, I can hear the influences, things like that of being, being able to really put that emphasis on the experience. Cause I mean, at the end of the day, it's how you make people feel. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the job of the leader, right. To create more leaders, to create more opportunities for them to grow and be successful. I want to hear your your story of how you like, did you start as a teacher and just kind of move the way up that I would say is kind of the most common track that we've seen people move in into the superintendent role? Yeah. So my first job for many, many years was a, a water well driller. So I worked on the back of a well rig and learned a lot of different things about hard blue collar work for all my life. Cause that was my father. He was a third generation. And then I, you know, got looked at, said, you want to do the business? Or you want to go to school? And I was a big soccer player and I loved working camps and so forth. I was like, I want to go to school. I see what you do. I don't want to do what you do. And that's hard, amazing work what they did, but it wasn't in my bloodline and my vision for going forward. So yeah, jumped into teaching. Uh, I was also a coach for soccer for a couple of years. And then an opportunity presented itself. I got my master's before I got tenure out here and an opportunity presented itself by four and a half years in my teaching to become a vice principal. Um, because I gave up every duty, lunch, and everything just to work with them to get better. And then from there, did vice principal for roughly about five years in a very, very large school district, a very diverse school district. And then from there, went on to be principal for four years. Uh, had some amazing experiences there. Um, but I definitely, you know, give a lot of my credit to my staff with the work that they did for all the uh, different awards that came our way as a school and for myself. And then went on the superintendency at a town that I grew up in for four years. And then when Brigantine opened up, I was like, this is an opportunity to go back to a district. It was always a lighthouse in my idea, in my view, uh, coming up through the ranks, looking at them. And I wanted to be part of that. I wanted to be part of a community that's near the beach that has great people and that we're growing great things. And I just wanted to see if I could add value to that. Well, so, when you look at that career path, were you thinking early on, like, oh, I can see myself kind of moving up through in, into different leadership and into district roles? Or was it more of like a step by step of just focus on what's the what's the next thing in front of you? It was almost like a more fate, which is <laughs> Latin words like embrace the fate that comes to you. You know, I love coaching when I was teaching and, you know, at the varsity level. But then an opportunity came and presented itself. And I was like, you know, I can make a bigger difference. But I remember people saying, oh, you'll make a superintendent one day. And I was like, you are crazy. I do not want to do that job. And (laughs) I kept going through the ranks and I kept seeing what was going on and the possibilities to have a bigger impact and bigger influence. I said, you know, maybe that is an opportunity that I want to pursue. And uh, so, yeah, for the longest time, I said it wouldn't be me. And here I am. Being- yeah, uh, that's usually the, the best way, right? I mean, it's almost like servant leadership when it, yeah, when it, when it comes to you. Um, you have something in your background that I thought was really interesting and that you have the blue collar kind of experience. Are you a Malcolm Gladwell guy? Follow any of his work? Okay. So he had a, he had a revisionist history episode that looked at, had the best lawyers basically looked at like kind of the money ball approach of there is a firm that's going to pick, well, who are the best lawyers in America? What are the, what are the attributes and who, how do you find them? Because most just assume like you had to go to one of the top law schools and, and the number one indicator was not where you went to school in fact where you went to school had zero effect but the number one is if they had black had a any type of blue collar work experience 
Interesting. Yeah, I, th- I think about that. The hardships that I, you know, being a superintendent today in 2023 is not a dream job by any choice for many people across the country. Look at it. You know, I get emails every day of people getting laid off, you know, resigning, whatever it may be for all the craziness political wise going on. I'm blessed where I am with the people that I have around me and my board and my council and the mayor and the staff, you know, and the, and the kids. But I think that resiliency did pay off. I really do. I talk to my kids here at the school all the time. I'm like, look, the top CEOs of Fortune 500 companies did not go to every Ivy League school. You know, the most successful people do not have that kind of track. They have a different track where it's a school that you mentioned that you've never heard of. But they put in that, you know, that perseverance, that resiliency to push through. Um, you know, and also I love the one book range. I don't know if you read that at all by uh, David Epstein. He talks about how different experiences and different fields give you a much broader perspective and such as life. But yeah, I really think back about that. Like, so when I even do hiring, I'm really intrigued to see what people's backgrounds are. What have they been through? And what haven't they been through? And, you know, such as that. So, yeah, from what I remember about range, it was almost like the exact opposite of like the 10,000 hour rule of like, you got to specialize in one thing really early right. on. Yep. It's yep. really looking at like that depth and making sure that, yeah, being able to transfer. And I, I talk about that kind of as an entrepreneur and in like the entrepreneur community, it's this super power that you can look at things that are totally, they seem unrelatable, but where is that crossover? Where can you learn something and apply it into something else? That's going to lead to my next question for you is the things that you sound like an entrepreneur when I look at like what you're reading and how you approach it, who are like, who are your influences to kind of think that way? Or like, what what are, what are the things that you surround yourself to make sure that you're not kind of just always locked in just in the education world? Yeah. So something I got into, I don't know how many years ago now. I really don't read educational books. I read, you know, leadership books from all different types of backgrounds. You know, being a history major and being a history teacher, you know, you think about that. These people have been through this for 2,000, 3,000 years in this in this planet. And a lot of it, human nature really doesn't change. So I, I look at it from that lens. I'm always looking at, you know, whether it's... Uh, whether it's military, whether it's an emperor or a CEO or a CFO or whoever it may be, Joe Schmo, uh, I'm very intrigued on how people uh, lead others, work with others, and do all that, you know, the psychology aspect of it. I never thought I'd really dive into that when I was back in high school, but here I am intrigued in that. You know, for many years, I was prim and proper. I had to be, you know, wear the suit, wear professionalism and so forth. And then I never forget, I, I was what a... Um, I have an Ivy League school over the summertime for this design thinking project that we were doing. And it was an amazing conference with top-notch thinkers from all across the country. And this one guy gets up and he looks like he's going to a Jimmy Buffett concert. Like he's just dressed down. And I'm like, here I am in suit and tie. And this guy, who's he? And he gets up and it's the dean of education and gives this amazing speech. And I'm just like, wow, you know, and I started thinking about that. Like what was his appearance towards his fellow professionals? And then, you know, I remember one year, I was like, you know, I had a boss that was amazing. He really pushed me outside my comfort zone. And he made me dress down the one day. I'd never dress down. He's like, you must dress down or I'm going to write you up. Uh, Like, it was just a weird aspect, but he did it. And it really helped influence me. And then I started, he he dressed up one time. And I was like, you know, the kids love this. So, you know, a few years later, I got in the superintendency and I I put on this, uh, what was it? Oh, it was a Christmas suit one of those wacky Christmas suits. And I put it on like two days before the holiday break and the fire department came and there's a lot of grandparents involved that day going on. And they're like, that is amazing. You're making people smile. What are you wearing tomorrow? And I was like, Oh no. I was like, I called my wife. I was like, go to Kohl's, go to Target, go wherever you can buy me more. Um, but now I have one for every holiday. And I say it all the time. Like we've done in this district and elsewhere, such amazing work. But yet the people were like, you're the guy that wears crazy suits. You're the guy that makes people smile. You know, like it's, I'm like, yeah, but I've done a million other things too, (laughs) educational life, but they remembered a little things that you cared, you know? So once again, going back to that leadership quality. So um, like I said, surrounding myself with amazing books, surrounding myself with all kinds of different podcasts, constantly pushing my thinking, having mentors, having reverse mentors, people who are just, you know, have a conversation on how to be a better father, 
how to be a better husband, how to be a better educator, how to be a better leader. I really enjoy having those conversations. I really enjoy reading those books because you can't always pick your mentors. You can't always pick who you're going to be, your parents are or whatever, but I have the opportunity to pick up books left and right. And I have the opportunity to pick up podcasts left and right and just learn as much as I can. And I really appreciative of that, that we are able to do that in this day and age. Yeah, for sure. And I think, so I don't know how much you know about our audience. I'll, I'll give you a little bit of breakdown so we can kind of talk to each one because kind of like where we were talking a little bit about range of like, how do we get this kind mm-hmm. of crossover? But we, we're we affiliated with this education leaders organization, which is the confidential peer network for school leaders to be able to learn from each other. Kind of, we always talk about it's the 5% that you don't have outlets for in other ways. Like you probably can't talk to your board members or uh, staff about certain things. There's maybe certain things you just don't want to bring home or your, your spouse is just tired of hearing it and it's hurting that relationship. Yep. So so where do you have those in there? Um, I think you're speaking kind of that lingo um, to, to those. Um, but there, we also have kind of a, a group of um, people that are designing schools. So these are the architects and that's through our affiliation with this association for learning environments. Yep. Um, how, how much like I, I hear you and you in the culture aspect is just like oozing out of you. How much do like those spaces matter? Do you pay attention to that or what's your perspective on what yeah. those like the facilities a, and the spaces look like? Yeah. So I look at it like I'm a designer. All right. And I have a great friend of mine, David Jakes, who does a lot of designing, had him come in multiple times. Um, you know, and David and I talked about that. He's like, what is the experience we want to create? So the second you cross the threshold onto my property, what does it look like? When you cross the threshold into the building, do you start to feel that? When you cross the threshold into a classroom, do you even call it a classroom? Do you call it a learning lab? Do you call it a studio? So the vernaculars are very, very particular in that situation. But everything we do here is a design. You know, so like we just demolished a quarter of the building and what's next? You know, I've heard every rumor in the rim, in the windmill, like what's going to happen here? You know, what are they putting in next? We're putting a green space. We're putting an outside farmer's a garden out there to eventually go to the farmer's market and so forth and have that community garden, have the green space in an area that doesn't have much green space. So everything is intentional. You know, we just had our entire brand new entryway painted by a local artist with everything that was brigantine. And we asked the kids, hey, you could pick three things that rec- remind you of brigantine. They'll paint it into this already prescripted thing that they have in mind. So for us, it's also the classroom desk, it's the classroom de- uh, tables and so forth, the smart boards and so forth, the projection. Um, but the kids helped me pick it. You know, when we redid the redesign from the library to the commons, now we have an annex of the library, every ELA teacher has a giant section of the old library in their classroom. So they have books there, as well as the new library that we call the Commons. The kid designed it. They picked the furniture. They picked all the the, uh, the different spacing in there. Same with the eSports Arena. They helped design that. They designed their own mascot. They picked out and made their own uniforms that we purchased for them. You know, And then they're not even in school colors. They're not even in school mascot. But yet, that's, as they told me, this is their avatar. And if you're a gamer, you know that that's who they are. So plus they picked a pretty cool name. They're the Megalodons, the Megs. So they're like, oh, nice. competition. I'm like, you guys win. All right. I know we're the Buccaneers <laughs> and Pirates, but you guys are cool. So, but they design all that. And the fact that when we started having some of the furniture start coming in the last year and a half and the kids are like, I'm like, Hey, have you gotten up to this room yet? They're like, no. I'm like, and I show them pictures. They're like, I picked that. That was my pick. That was who I put on there with a bunch of green dots when we did a whole charrette around the whole room of what we want to design, what we didn't want in there, what is the experience you try to create. Every room that we have in our district is all writable tables. So, you know, we've invested a lot into the markers. You know, we have our own laundry thing going now for the erasers and so forth. Um, But everything and anything is intentional. The brand new playground that we have for pre-K, they helped me pick it up. The pre-Kers. You know, which was love it. yeah. Now the the bigger playground we're getting new additions for and so forth. We put a pavilion up outside that uh, big and beautiful. And outside, it looks like a Hallmark movie when we do our um, wintertime choir out there. But everything the staff, the kids had the invitation to pick what and how they want to be able to use it. It's our school. It's not mine. So everything and do we do here is intentional by design. Because I think if you're you're doing it wrong, if you don't. <laughs> 
you know, if you become a second rate replica of what you were taught before, then that's great. It has some value to it, but you could be different. And like I said, if you had a mentor that didn't teach you to think differently, it, it definitely plays an effect. And, you know, so you could be the play it safe principal or play it safe superintendent, or you can be the one that actually stirs it up a little bit. You're always going to have people in the background that aren't happy with everything. But when the majority of the population is extremely happy and eager to want to be there and they know that you care, you know, we, we, we built a whole brand new, we used an old gym, I don't, sorry, an old cafeteria. We made it the whole mindfulness area. So now they have uh, Gaga in there. They have ping pong in there. They have basketball in there. We made a Zen den for the kids that need that. We have an interactive floor, which is a video game for kids to get a timeout or PT and OT. You name it somehow, some way, the intentionality, the design, the conversations are behind that. Thanks to them. Yeah, that's great to hear. We always talk about making sure you get that student pull in, that buy in. Did you, did you also kind of look at teachers' communities, or did you really kind of let the students really be like the the primary driver of things? It was it was both. It was the teachers and the and the kids. So you know, the, the, it was up to the kids. They pick some wacky things that I can't afford. <laughs> under the insurance companies in New Jersey the same way. And we at the same time we have to talk to the staff too and say, hey, yeah. this is your this is your environment that you're in here trying to make a difference in the lives of these children. What would you like? How would you like it? Yeah. Uh, and that was the that was a way of getting a buy in because, like I said. Any person can come into a district and say they're going to do it their way. But if you don't get the buy-in, you know, and you don't have a collaborative effort, then you're just doing it wrong. So yeah. like I said, you check that ego at the door and, you know, you, your job as a leader is to make every teacher better, make every kid better, make anybody in the better in the building better. That's, that's your job overall, you know? Yeah. So a lot of times we forget about that or a lot of times people were brought up through the ranks and they forgot the number one most important thing is people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're kind of leading me into that third group of, of our audience. We always just call them like the change makers, but it's really people that even get beyond the walls of education. It's the ones that, you know, like just have a passion to giving every kid the best opportunity to succeed. And um, that's a little bit of, of we, we're affiliated with a nonprofit called Second Class Foundation that the purpose is to try to drive some of that culture change in our society um, more to positively impact really education, but through the use of media and storytelling, like how do we meet people where they're at with compelling stories, whether it's, you know, like, and the first major projects we're doing a transformation show of doing like a, a makeover show, like how people don't know if they haven't been to a school inside a school for 20, 30 years, they don't know what you're talking about. You know, like, yeah, they hear writable surfaces or, you know, they hear some of these things that you're talking about, like, whoa, what, what are you talking about? Like, I only know what I know when I went to school. How much are you kind of telling the story out to the communities? And and I'd love to hear, like, kind of how you're doing that. Is there like a coordinated effort to, to do that? Yeah. So the best part about it is we, we brought in a YouTube channel here. So, you know, for the gamers, they have their Twitch channel, which is the BCS Megs. And then for the YouTube it is the BCC News. So if you just go onto YouTube and type in Brigantine Community School, you know, I went to a couple of teachers last year and said, hey, we need to bring in this TV studio. It, it retired years ago when somebody else retired and no one ever jumped on it. So I jumped in with student council and jumped in with a couple of people and an art teacher. And she digitalized the art and what she did. So now each and every day, the news broadcast goes out there, but they created so many different segments, caught being great cooking with the, with the cooking ladies downstairs, working with different businesses around town. Everything and anything is advertised through the student voice, not mine, not the teacher. You know, we'll get interviewed from time to time, but these kids keep coming up with great ideas. One was uh, hooked on books and a, and a seventh and eighth grader are like, look, let's talk and interview the little guys, you know, first, second, third grade, what their favorite book is and why is it their favorite book? So it gives them a voice too. But they did an amazing job of allowing that freedom and autonomy to take place, you know, and we and we teamed up with the Chamber of Commerce. We do another uh, class called the Mr. Rogers Project. And it was right after the pandemic. We said, look, you know, I want to get the chamber involved. I want the kids to get start entrepreneurial business thinking and so forth. So we talked about how do we create this program? And we call it Mr. Rogers. And sadly, most of the people, the kids don't know who Mr. Rogers is anymore, mm -hmm. but we bring in through the Chamber of Commerce, and you have to pay to be part of the membership, different businesses that want to get a reestablished or brand new uh, social media presence. So our kids in the eighth grade work uh -huh. with them 
you know, to build a social media platform. And these businesses come in and they'll say, look, they're pre-assigned too. So, you know, not everybody can go to the surf shop. They're going to be deviated out, you know, differentiated out. But they have to hear the pitch from the business owner. They have to hear the background from the business owner. The business owner gives the kids their email, their phone number, so they can ask questions and all that. But they're also talking about like, who are we trying to showcase to? So a lot of times it's towards the kid, the younger population which is amazing because you think of that reverse mentoring right there. So now they go through the process. They put together the, the Instagram page. They put together the Facebook page. They do a QR code that you can have on the door when you walk into the business to zap into. And then the businesses pick a top winner. And at the end of the year, after a couple of classes, they give out a scholarship for the kid as well. Very so, cool. you know, and now there's a waiting list to get on this Mr. Rogers project. <laughs> so now we have the chamber working with kids through how many different businesses and we have this, this YouTube channel going out every single day with the kids who are the entrepreneurs in this area of speaking and, and actively learning. And they're doing so many great things. Like when we present too, I, we have the kids present all over the state. We have them present. I could talk and say how great the school is. The kid's going to tell you the truth, isn't he? He or she is going to tell you straight up. Yeah, we don't do that here. Or we do do that here. So we had them present at several state Ed tech conferences. We had the crew walking around interviewing ed tech companies. We had, and it was a competition between the both. We go to the next session, and the kids were doing this at fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade level, which I would never have done as a young kid. I would have been petrified. But yet we're giving them that opportunity. Maybe they want to become the influencer one day. You know, maybe they want to start their own podcasting. And that's where we're going to start this year, too. On top of that, is the podcasting for the kids. We're creating that room for them now. Um, but we give them a lot of freedom. We give them a lot of trust. And we give them a lot of respect because they are our greatest ambassadors. Those kids, our staff. And like I said, now we have the community working with us, too. So the message gets out there and that's, you know, we, and we, I try to put everything out on social media as I can too, to celebrate all the great things they're doing. Yeah. And I mean, you, you can hear that in there. Are there certain things that, and I hate to even ask this because you just told me all these amazing things you're doing and you can feel kind of the culture, but is there kind of this innate demand of like, how do we rank? Like, what do we, what do we care about? Like, like, are there things that like your board or your community is looking at, looking at, or you personally are looking at and say like, these are measurements that we want to view as, as kind of the, what we're aiming for or what the, what the goal is out of our yeah. district. Yeah. So, you know, this past year was the first time in over 20 plus years, we got designated the high performing school district and we weren't focusing on that. We were focusing on tutoring programs. We were focusing on, you know, helping these kids out in different areas, getting the reading specialists, the math coaches and stuff like that. So we focused intentionally behind the design of a lot of different things with the process in mind. We knew what the goal was to get to that goal, but the process was we were going to put day in and day out a lot of sweat and effort into this to make it work. So yeah, what does everybody want? They want the best possible school for their children. You know, I'm a father. That's what I want. You know, I want somebody that it goes in day in and day out to their profession and treats it as a profession, not just a job. So, like I said, when we celebrate those little things, you know, great things come along the way. You know, we're hosting a group of superintendents this upcoming October from ASA, uh, which is the CWAR programs that are going on. So people feeling celebrated, see those types of things and great things keep coming about it. If we just focused on their scores and standardizing every kid, we well, in all honesty, I think that's where we see a lot of our problems for the last 20, 30 years in education in, in the whole country. We've been so fixated on that. We forgot about critical thinking. We forgot about the skills. And I don't call them soft skills anymore. The shaking a hand, having a conversation, the inquiry thinking, you know, the, the design that they're creating as well. Those are the things we need to focus on in the society. And then now you have artificial intelligence. How are you going to utilize that? You know, so because the businesses that don't use that are going to be out of business. So we have to teach kids now to work with somebody that they already are. They're already doing Alexa, Siri, and a bunch of other things and chat GDP and all the other, you know, great things that keep evolving every day. But we focus on the kids, you know, but my measurement is I want to see who's coming to school every day, you know, our absentee yeah. rates going down or up as our discipline going down or up, are we creating an opportunity and experience for these kids that want to be here? 
you know, so those are the things that we measure. And I'm very blessed that the board and the, you know, the city want the same thing. They want nothing but the best for their kids. And they know they have loving, caring professionals in each and every classroom. And that, you know, the administrative team is the same way. They're very invested into knowing each and every family that's here. As you're heading into the 2023-24 year, what what are those opportunities, challenges, things that are kind of keeping you awake or you know getting you energized? What what's what's the next year look like for you? Well, hopefully my construction projects will be done. I keep looking outside because <laughs> there's so many moving parts, but we're excited about that. So it'll be year two for our cybersecurity class. It'll be year three for our Mr. Rogers. Like I said, we have some new learning spaces for the kids as well. They're the things that keep me excited. You know, the things that keep me concerned is, you know, what's going to come down from the state? What's going to come from the departments of ed? Are we going to have the freedom and autonomy to do some great things? Or are we going to continue to be standardized for these children? You know, so, you know, I like to stay in that gray area to do the best we can uh, for our kids. And I know we have to do all the state requirements and so forth. But, you know, those are the things that keep me up when I get an update from the state on a Friday at 4.30 in the afternoon after everybody's going home for the day. Like, you know, as a leader, I don't even send out emails then. You know, when is the appropriate time to send out the email to help out your staff? You know, when is the appropriate time to have those conversations? You know, I'm very big in that that timing aspect as well, because they have family lives outside of school, too. But like I said, we have just have so many great things coming up this year with the, with the group coming this year in October. Um, and we have a couple of new projects new coming out, too. This will be also year number three for the Grinch. We do a big Grinch chase for the police department, the fire department, chamber of commerce. We the whole entire community gets involved and we do a giant filming that the kids storyboard and lead the entire process. So, you know, it, it's a fun activity to get everybody involved. Well, I love it. Thank you for your time and, and sharing this. I hope it inspires some people. I hope, I hope it's something that uh, gets people thinking like, yeah, this this is what education is about. This is about bringing communities together. And it really, you know, does you know, say all the time when we talk about it in our ELO, it's like it, it, it's always at the top. It starts at the top. So we got to have people in there that that have that energy, that have that fire because it it really does. It influences the staff, the students, the community. And uh, yeah, can't thank you enough for what you're doing and for your time today. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, just a reminder to the listeners, if you're not already subscribed, hit subscribe wherever you're listening to. And uh, we have a couple of surveys and things on there that on uh, betterlearningpodcast.com to move move forward into some different topics. Uh, we have a lot of exciting things coming up here in the fall and uh, and then moving forward. So Glenn, great talking to you and appreciate everything you're doing. Thank you. The views and opinions expressed on the Better Learning Podcast are those of myself as an individual and my guests and do not necessarily represent the organizations that we work for, the Association for Learning Environments, K-12, Education Leaders Organization, or Second Class Foundation.